So about three to four years ago in road cycling, we saw a big migration towards frames coming out with dropped seat stays, whereas the previous generation might have had a normal seat stay design like this one behind me, where the seat stays meet the seat tube and the top tube at a cluster. It seemed like every new bike that was coming out, whether it be the Tarmac SL6 or Bayer Orca, Cannondale Super 6 Evo, Focus's Alco, had dropped seat stays. And the manufacturers were saying, oh, this is for aerodynamic gains and improved compliance or comfort at the back end of the bike. Now, the aerodynamic claims are kind of marginal at best because the lack of frontal area you get from dropping the seat stays is so small, I doubt you can even measure it in a wind tunnel. But moreover, they were pushing this thing about saying it makes the rear end of the bike a lot more comfortable because the rear triangle can flex and it helps the seat post deflection. Now, if you think about what is comfort, you could say it's the accelerations or lack of accelerations you feel when seated in the bike coming from a given bump input in the road. Now, how can you improve comfort in a bike? Well, in very layman's terms, you want to increase the time span of those bump inputs, which will reduce the acceleration you feel. That goes for anything. That goes for you jumping off a wall. It goes for a suspension on a mountain bike. Anything with suspension is designed to increase the time span of an event to reduce the peak forces. Now, on a bike, believe it or not, everything is a spring, whether it's the seat post, the saddle, the wheels, the tires, everything has a certain amount of deflection and a spring rate associated with it and everything on a bike can be a spring in series. So you can approximate the rider sitting on the saddle um, between him and the ground or her and the ground is a set of springs all in series. And those um, spring rates of each of those components kind of add up to provide the suspension system of the bike. Now, I'm gonna say it's suspended because it is, it's a spring and some things in those uh, spring series have dampers associated with them as well because a tire actually has quite a lot of damping in it from rubber hysteresis. Other things we'll assume are just plain springs with no dampers. But even though you look at a road bike and say, well, it has no suspension, it does because everything in life, even a concrete lump, has a spring rate associated with it. And these things kind of get diluted as you series them up. Now, what can you do to improve the comfort of a bike? Like I said, you want to reduce the accelerations, increase the time span of that event. And the easiest way to do that on a road bike is to reduce the spring rate of one of those elements. So increase the amount of deflection that it goes through. Now, I can tell you now, um, the most deflection you get on a bike, particularly we're just talking about the rear end, is the tire and the seat post. Everything else, well not everything, but mainly the frame being like a double diamond, very stiff truss structure, has orders of magnitude less deflection than a seat post or the tire. And I've done this little graphic just to show you how little deflection the frame is giving. Now, don't start crowing and say, where is the calc for that? This is just a picture representation of that. Um, but we'll get into some numbers later and we'll actually get into some engineering. But the frame, it doesn't matter what you do to it. If it's a double diamond structure in plane, in the vertical plane, it's so stiff relative to even the fork, which is a cantilever, the seat post is a cantilever, and the tire maybe has 10 or 15 mil of travel in it as well. So, I mean, crikey, even your choice of bib shorts and chamois will have more deflection than the frame. So, to see if drop seat stays actually make a difference, I modelled my own custom geometry uh, and applied some load cases to it, and we looked at drop seat stays, normal seat stays, and slightly lifted seat stays as well, like the Lightspeed TI2 that I've been riding recently, to see what the difference is. And we also looked at the mechanical strength of differences between those as well because if you're making a custom TI bike that, let's say, isn't gonna be ISO tested in fatigue like a mass-produced bike will be, you need to know that if you drop the seat stays on that, or if you've got a custom-welded TI bike or a steel bike or aluminium bike, that those welds aren't gonna fail in fatigue. And position of the seat stays can be quite important with that as well. So that's why I really did this study in the first place, was to check that. But then I also wanted to prove that the drop seat stays really don't have much more comfort at all. It's all in the seat post. So let's have a quick look at the frame setup. Here I've modelled my kind of perfect geometry in a frame. I've used kind of titanium wall thicknesses because at some point I'm actually going to specify a TI build for myself. And I wondered, should I go for drop seat stays or not? But anyway, I drew up my geometry, stack, reach, seat tube angle, everything I prefer. And I use very common titanium wall thicknesses. Now, seat stay inclination or seat stay angle is basically the last piece of the puzzle when you're designing a frame. It doesn't really affect anything else for the major geometry. Um, it's more just aesthetics, really. So you can pick a very steep seat stay or a dropped seat stay, and it won't affect stack reach, anything like that. So a lot of people just pick it for aesthetics. Some people say it's aero, some people say it's comfort. As you can see here, you can have 58, you know, having it, having it meet the uh, seat tube and top tube cluster, or you can go for a very dropped seat stay. I wouldn't advise that because you'll 
stress the welds too much, as we'll see in a bit. But my point is, you can you can change the seat stay angle to pretty much whatever you want it to be. It doesn't affect the geometry. Now, for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to set the seat stay angle as 48 in the drop position, and I think it was about 59 if I want it clustered at the seat tube and top tube junction, which is kind of more um, traditional. And then I've also done a case where I've lifted the seat stays ever so slightly offset from that cluster. Now obviously to apply the load to the frame I modelled an aluminium seat post with a typical wall thickness and for each model I kept the seat post insertion into the frame exactly the same. And when we go to see the modelling the seat post insertion does actually make quite a big effect on not obviously the deflection of course because it's a cantilevered and cantilevered deflection goes up with the length cubed but it does affect the max stresses you get on the weld. Now onto the actual modeling of cases. Um, the model is set up, so it's constrained at the rear dropout and has a sliding constraint on the bottom race of the headset. So it's not perfectly assuming, you know, a two wheel constraint, but it's good enough to compare between each run of simulation. And I've applied a 200 kilo or 2000 Newton load at the top of the seat post in the, in the basically straight down direction. Uh, slightly offset with a setback seat post as you can see here and like I said before I've kept the seat post insertion the same between each simulation. What did I measure in each simulation? Well the max deflection of the seat post and also measured the max stress that you can expect at the at the welds in the rear triangle. Now that is very approximated because with when you're welding you get heat affected zones the metallic structure or the crystalline structure of the metal actually changes a little bit so it's not a perfect assumption to model this from FEA. Uh, modeling welded joints is quite difficult but it's just a basic, a very basic simulation. 200 kilos on the seat post, we measured the max deflection in the seat post at the top so where the saddle would be, we measured it in the x direction and we measured it in the z direction so how far back and how far down did the seat post move which I'm basically assimilating to comfort and deflection. So this is the normal seat stay case. This is the drop seat stay case. You can see a bit of the kind of decoupling in the frame where the, the drop seat stays meet the seat tube. There is a bit more flex in the seat tube of the frame itself, but the actual seat post deflection is really the main driver here. The frame is so stiff compared to the seat post. It really is the seat post uh, choice and the seat post exposure, the unsupported length of the seat post, which gives you the deflection. Yes, the drop seat stays do add a little bit, but it's still a truss-like structure. And when we get to the actual results in the Excel, you'll see how small the difference is. So the drop seat stays really don't make a difference in the comfort. It's all in the seat post, as you can see here. And just for your reference, this is modeled as a typical aluminum seat post, and the frame is titanium. And again here, we've got the lifted seat stay position, just like the light speed that I rode a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, just to see if that makes any difference only in this case to the, the von Mises stress of the welds on the welded area to see why they do that. Is it aesthetic or is it for a fatigue purpose for the weld condition? But again, you can see all the deflection out of the frame from an input on the saddle at least is in the seat post. The frame really is so stiff compared to the unsupported seat post or the cantilever of the seat post that drop seat stays, lifted seat stays, normal seat stays, it really doesn't make a difference. Now I've plotted the results in, in an Excel which I'll have a quick look at so we've got the drop seat stay case, we've got the normal seat stay case and the lifted seat stays. Now I've plotted the seat post deflection at the top of the seat post in the two different directions, so how far back and how far down it goes. In all cases the seat post actually travels, or the top of the seat post travels further back than it does down, and I've basically got a combination of that travel in what I've called hypotenuse. So these figures here are the, basically the total or the resultant deflection of the saddle, let's say, or the top of the seat post. And we can see drop seat stays has the highest normal seat stays then and then the lifted seat stays. But the difference between the drop seat stays and the normal seat stays is so small. It's about 0.1 millimeters in eight mil. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny difference. And the compromise that it gives the structure of the frame by decoupling that truss, I would say it's not worth it because it makes the layup a little bit more tricky in, in welding. It could stress the welds a little bit more, which I've tried to analyze here. So I've got 
the peak stresses at the junctions seat tube to top tube and seat stay to seat tube. Um, and we can see in the drop seat stay case, the peak stress at the seat tube to top tube junction is higher, but it's about the same as the peak stress with a normal seat stay case for the seat stay to seat tube. So I can't really deduce a lot from that, whether it's better for the world or worse for the world. And actually, as a comment, those seat stay to seat tube stresses are very sensitive to the seat post engagement and the interface, interface friction between the seat post inside the frame and the tube. So I can't really conclude much about that. And it is very sensitive to the how much seat post you have in the frame is how much decoupling you get. And then something I'll come on to in a later video is the first kind of resonance modes of each frame shape. Um, and we can see the first fundamental frame resonance mode is basically what you feel if, you, if you're standing over your bike with your feet on the floor, lift the bars up, tap the wheel on the ground, and it's that in-plane um, fork wobble front wheel tap uh, vibration. That's the, that's the lowest fundamental frequency of a bike frame. And both, they're about 21 hertz. No real difference between each case. The third mode, which is what I call speed wobble, we can see that the normal seat, seat stay frame does have a bit more transverse stiffness out of plane. Um, but again, we'll come on to that in a later video. But anyway, the point of this video is to show you that drop seat stays, normal seat stays, the difference in deflection that gives the seat post is so small compared to the seat post itself. The tire deflection, which is going to be probably around 15 millimeters, 10 millimeters, depends on the pressure, of course. Uh, but we can hear, you see here nearly got 10 millimeters or eight millimeters of deflection in the seat post. The difference between one and the other frame design really doesn't make a difference. It's such a stiff truss structure. If you're picking drop seats, seat stays for a titanium frame that's custom built to your geometry, um, don't forget when you, when you buy a custom titanium frame in a custom geometry, those frames aren't ISO fatigue tested like a normal volume production frame would be and changing angles and clusters and welded joints you really need to you really need to fatigue test it and is your custom ti frame manufacturer going to build you a sample fatigue test it and then build you once that passes and then build you a final one no they're basically just going to build one which isn't fatigue tested so you have to be very careful when you drop a seat stay in, in either a carbon or one, a one-off carbon or a one-off titanium or one-off steel frame or even aluminium. You need to make sure that those stresses aren't going to be too much for the welds. So thanks for staying through that. I hope you enjoyed that. If you've got any comments, please put them down below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, come back for more next time. Cheers, see you in the next one.